Thank you all for coming to the first of the In the Know conversations. Um, I'm Derek Witcherly. I'm the collections manager here at my Mac. And I'm very excited to introduce to you a well-known Missoula painter and performance artist, Leslie Van Stavern Miller. Now, a little bit about Leslie. Um, Leslie moved here in the 70s when it wasn't an easy place to move to become an artist, um, but she did it, so that says something about her character. And, and she attended Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts, which was uh, an all-women's college. And Leslie was the first student there to propose and undergo a uh, like an intersectional course which was interdepartmental. Mm -hmm. interdepartmental between biology and art, which was very radical. Um, <laughs> so without further ado, here is the rad Leslie. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, and I will just tell you right now, uh, I don't do performance art very often, but it will reflect the fact that I'm a science woman and I'm appearing here in that guise has a lot to do with the way I approached this lecture, which is analyzing kind of what was influencing me, how I got from there to here. Um, and so it also gives me an opportunity to carry a um, clipboard, <laughs> which if you were normally just like as a regular person, it would look a little dorky. But as a scientist, it's perfectly OK, as well as all the uh, gear for the sound. So, um, yeah, so as science woman, I'm going to start this lecture, but I will be talking to you as Leslie Van Stavern Millar. And there's pretty much like three parts to this, so hang in there. The very beginning will be me talking about my background, um, because with that interest in science and biology and botany especially, I've had an interest in genetics. How, how are we who we are in terms of what we've inherited? from our chromosomes and our immediate family, and then also the effect of your environment and your experiences, some of which were planned and some of which are very accidental. But so that, that's kind of where I'm gonna go. That's the beginning. And then uh, midway through, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about gouache, which is the paint that these paintings have been done with because it's not extremely well known. And then I'll conclude, the, the larger portion of it will be about these paintings in particular and the series that they are part of. Um, and then we'll, and there will be a little time for questions at the end. If you have a question along the way that needs to be answered about something that I've said, please just jump in, okay? So um, I was very fortunate that um, both sides of my parents' family have artists and scientists and people that like detail work, weavers, master weavers that were imported from Wales to the United States to run mills in Delaware. Um, an inventor, my dad's father was an inventor of uh, objects that he um, patented during World War II. So there's like both threads and because we are in matriarchy by nature in our family, all that was honored both for the males in the family but the females as well. And so, um, the other lucky thing is that my dad was a chemical engineer at the time when the U.S. was expanding after World War II, and he benefited from the GI Bill and got a degree, and then ultimately took his family, which they, the corporations would not do now, they just would not do it, but they sent the entire family to Iran in 1957, and we were there for four years from the time I was seven to 11. And I was very, very lucky. I was the oldest, so my parents did more things with me because I was older than my siblings. And I, was, I knew what was, I, I could see things. I, was, I had already attended first grade in the United States. I knew how to read. I had been introduced to art by my mother's mother and my aunt. And so I had this sense of things. And I also have very distinct memories of being in Baltimore, Maryland, and Wilmington, Delaware, where we lived until 1957. And it was, it was America at that time, which was McCarthy and black and white TV and the fascination with the new technology and food processing from canned food. I mean, it was like a sort of a strange period in the US. 
And I was lucky enough that we moved to a country that was extremely exotic and very interesting. And it was, it was what was considered third world at the time. But that meant that everything was pretty simple. A lot of things were made by hand. Things were very real. And I think that um, kind of essential core of seeing people happy in circumstances that were very different than what was going on in the US with this kind of explosion into consumerism, that it, it had a big effect on me. And I was really lucky because of having been introduced to art by my, my relatives, I looked at I looked at the art and it was very different than what I was seeing in the US. Um, the other thing that happened that was fortunate is because traveling was so difficult at that time, like flying to Iran took three days and um, it was all propeller planes. And so we did not go back to the United States in the summer when we had off from school, we went to Europe. And we went to Greece because it was closest to, um, you know, c kind of an uh, air flight away. Um, and that was the beginning of going to ruins. The other lucky thing is my mom was really young. She's only 19 years older than me, and she's a very curious person. So rather than leaving her children at home, she hauled us everywhere. We went everywhere. And it wasn't as a lesson. It's because she was really interested in things, and my father was as well. And so we benefited from this kind of approach that wasn't systematic prior to the beginning of the very big um, tourist industry in Europe and around globally that exists now. I mean, we went to places where there was very, there was no, there is really no structure. I remember being on Mykonos, which has a great reputation for like a party island and lots and lots of hotels and nude beaches. Well, there were two hotels on the whole island when we spent two months there in, the, in 58 and 60. And there were no tourists. I mean, the dining room is me and my mother and my siblings So uh, at, the, at this nice hotel. <laughs> so we were really lucky about that. But um, what I'd like to say is because of that, especially spending that time in Greece, we um, visited Delos, which is a really important archaeological island adjacent to um, where, where Mykonos is, and also went to um, Gnosis on Crete, which is where the Minoan uh, society flourished. And um, again, it was, it was available, you could do that, but there really was a low population of people being able to see that. And so one of the most distinct memories I have from probably being on Gnosis, I believe, is being outside of these um, kind of ruins that you could go into and sort of check it out. But you know, a lot of rubble, and there were stacks of amphora, stacks of amphora lying outside of what was probably their warehouses, maybe that's what it was that had been destroyed. But the amphora were just very casually presented and probably hadn't been moved in 1,500 years or 2,000 years. They were just there because some of the stuff that's happened since then where they're caring for things and protecting it and putting it in the museums and making sure they're not destroyed by the elements, all that wasn't happening. So things were much more raw. Um, so I was lucky about that. The other thing I want to go back to Iran is that it introduced me by being there to Persian miniature painting, um, which has really beautiful attributes and it has a narrative quality. They're smaller, you know, you can imagine like a seven or eight or nine year old girl looking at this stuff and being very impressed, having a strong impression at it. The same time we're going to Europe and going to the Tate or going to the big museums in Rome or Berlin or, you know, having that kind of juxtaposition of the traditional, uh, well-established European, mostly by men. And then in Iran, this tradition that was really intimate, really, really intimate. And I um, was lucky enough that my mom bought those paintings, not a lot, but she had, she had at least five or six that she put on the wall because they were not expensive and they, she liked art. So the, I got to look at that and that had a big effect on me. Um, so I would, how are we doing? You have 10 minutes. Uh, 10, okay, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to not stay on one topic too long. Okay, so fast forward, we moved back to the US, we're in Texas, and then I uh, went to Mount Holyoke College, which uh, is, is, is part of what I experienced. Uh, and at that time, I was really interested in um, both genetics and visual arts. Fortunately, I chose the visual arts because I think it's much 
works much best with my personality. <laughs> I don't think I'd be good in a lab situation. Um, but in that context, by the time I graduated, I was starting to work independently. I wanted to be independent. I was here. There was nobody teaching gouache here. I realized that gouache paint most closely aligned with the kind of paint that both the Persian miniature painters used, uh, apparently, um, what is it? I think also, um, yeah, illuminated manuscripts are painted with something very similar to that, and also some of the uh, ancient Egyptian painting. So there's like a long tradition of this. So I, I, what happened by then, by the mid-70s, I was living here and my parents were in Rome, and I would take every once, like every year or two, I would fly from Missoula all the way to Rome, but I would always have to break it up somewhere. So I was in London and went to the Windsor Newton store and realized that they had gouache paint and that it very closely resembled what I think those people were using, but in a contemporary fashion. So, so gouache is made of pigment, you got the color, and then you have the thing that is essentially the glue, the thing that holds the pigments together, and that is generally gum Arabic, although now I think they're using some synthetic materials. But at the, in the 70s when I started, it was definitely gum Arabic and then water to dilute it. So it's kind of similar to watercolor, but watercolor is very different because with watercolor, you're doing thin layers of the pigment amplified with the water, and then you're seeing the paper through the paint. So it's a very different technique. And watercolor, I would say as a group, watercolors are very different than my approach. I mean, I just, they're like a different kind of artist, basically. And, uh, and what's beautiful about gouache is it's opaque. So virtually every color but black has a small amount of white in it or something to elevate that and create that opacity. And so as opposed to the watercolors who probably are doing one or two layers where you're still continuing to see the paper through there, I'm very interested in covering everything. And so almost any of these paintings have at a minimum two coats of paint and probably as many as five or six. And it's very forgiving for that reason. So you, I, I think it's a really pretty um, remarkably flexible and easy medium. And I didn't know until about 10 years ago that it's not considered easy. <laughs> but I, I like degree of difficulty. So it was probably like something I could chew on, the fact that I was actually having to kind of stretch. But I was in London in 76 or 77, and I bought the paints. I bought some brushes. I'll show you. This is my little good. So these are the brushes that I use. And they're sable brushes. And if any of you paint, they're like zero, 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 and ones and twos and threes. So they're pretty small, um, which is my problem, basically. <laughs> the, paint, the brushes wear out pretty fast because they have so few hairs in them. They're sable. So I have that. And then I mix all my colors. I have a lot of gouache. The nice thing about gouache is since it's water soluble, it can dry out and you can use it. I mean, I could put this away for 10 years, dust it off, and the paints would be usable again. And you cannot do that with acrylics or oil paints. Uh, not possible. So I have way too many of these. I probably have like 80 uh, <laughs> paint dishes. And then I'll show you. The tubes of paint are generally pretty small. So they're like this. And I do a lot of mixing. I think it's fun, and the colors are very beautiful. I would say that's one of the characteristics of the Persian miniature paintings is the colors. I had a conversation with Christy last night. She very helpfully, you know, we discussed some of the talk, and she reminded me that the Persian miniature paintings, the, the pigment is beautiful. And it's very different than other paints because other, even other water-based paints, it's very soft looking. It has a very soft, and kind of beautiful texture. And I used to paint in casein, which is also water-based, and I've painted in acrylic, and they don't have the fineness that you can apply. And that's why I'm pretty convinced it's close to what the Persian miniature di people did, because if you look at their stuff, it's mind-boggling. It's, they probably are using brushes with like two hairs. And then the other thing I do when I'm working is I have on my reading glasses over my contact lenses, and I wear this. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> <it's> <laughs> so 
So, and I have three sets of these. These are really good. Um, so that's kind of the, the thing. And I, I should say that in the context of the Persian miniature painting, which again, nobody taught me. So everything was me just sort of looking at stuff and kind of figuring it out. But some of the characteristics are narrative, smaller work, oftentimes in books, uh, beautiful colors. Uh, what is, Raphael might be able to say that word better, but the, the bottom to top perspective is not conventional. <laughs> it's, 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 there's a bottom, I think Ted told me it was like bottom perspective. So things are at the bottom or in the foreground and as you get to the top they're further away. That's what it is. So it's a very different perspective than what Leonardo da Vinci and those guys were doing. I think it's very attractive. It may, it's sort of unusual because that's not really how we perceive things but it kind of lends itself to that narrative quality. Um, Okay, so, and I use rag paper, which is very good quality paper, as opposed to watercolors, oftentimes like a very textured paper with a bumpy surface. I want it smooth, I want it ironed. It's hot, called hot pressed. I use a hot pressed paper. Um, okay, so fast forward. I start doing these in the 70s. I've been doing them for about 20 years. So by the mid 90s, a whole bunch of things. Am I doing okay, Christy? Okay, so by the mid, mid 90s, number of things sort of came into, um, if I can find that. There. Oh, let's see. Yeah, a number of things came together, which is I started feeling very confident with the paint. Very confident with paint. I liked it. And I should say, when I started painting in the 70s with it, it was not a popular medium, especially in the art schools. And when I was in uh, at school, everybody's painting extremely large, abstract acrylic paintings, which I wasn't what I wanted to do. And so I have, I've been pretty good at sort of moving things out of my field of vision that don't work for me, uh, luckily. So I, I pretty much stuck with it, even though I did work in some other mediums in the 70s and 80s. But by the 90s, I was really on a roll with the uh, with the gouache. And so um, the other thing is the people that lived in Iran when we did, which were predominantly Europeans, there were not very many Americans, but there were Europeans, they, those people had a very special experience that was particular to when they lived there. And so there was a lot of uh, nostalgia about having lived in Iran, especially since the Shah was gone and everything has changed really dramatically politically there. So there uh, was a society called the Abinan Society that met informally and it was Europeans and Americans meeting like once every couple of years to get together and show slides or talk about what they had done and we'd have guest speakers. Anyway, I started attending those meetings in the 90s with my parents and that was really important and sort of reminding me of that background that I had even more than I had. So. That and then um, my, I started doing Science Woman in the early 90s, which sort of led to me feeling confident about using some of the traits that I consider scientific, like analyzing data, thinking about how you are influenced by things that you experience, especially as a kid. Um, and then, <laughs> let's see. And then repeated exposure to Amphora. I wanted to mention this. So here I am in Montana. My family's on the East Coast. I went through a 20 year period where I did not fly. And it, there were really good reasons for that, but it meant that to get from here to there, I didn't want to drive. I was taking the train regularly, like once a year, twice a year. And you can't go continuously from Montana to New York. You have to stop in Chicago and change trains, which worked greatly to my advantage because I got really good at running into the station, throwing my stuff in a locker, and then literally whether I had 45 minutes or four hours, like running down to the Art Institute, which is like a 10 or 15 minute fast walk too. And it was free admission at that time. It unfortunately no longer is. But I would pop in and I got, because of this like 15 year period of always going to the, I got very fond of the Art Institute and I started to understand like I'd have to walk past all these Chinese ceramics to get to this other area. And I started stopping in my rush and looking at those Chinese ceramics. And it was shocking because I started to go, oh my God, that, those people were working at the same time as the artisans in 
Greece and the Mediterranean. Maybe not identical forms, but very, very similar. You know, clay, simple decorations, and then they've lasted. And again, Christy and I were talking about it. It's like clay is this weird thing where it's very fragile. But once you've fired it, there's stuff that's 2,500 years old. I mean, it's pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. So that, that exposure at the Chicago Art Institute to remind me that it was a universal form and not just particular to one area also coincided with the fact that in the 80s, my parents had lived in Bangkok. And so by being in Bangkok, and it's totally wild atmosphere in the 80s, going there and to these markets where they were hauling all these ceramics from the seabed and who, probably looting them and whatever, but they were all in the markets. And again, it was the same thing. There was a lot of similarity in, t in intent and probably functional use of the, of the work that I was seeing. So all these kind of experiences reiterating the amphora shape or the clay shape. So how are you doing now? <laughs> it's, it's 22 after. Okay, I think I'm doing okay. Okay, so so uh, and then oh, I just I have to tell you one or two little stories just because it's it's so charming. So my dad worked in Tripoli from 1968 to 1971. So we were there when Gaddafi had his coup d'état and kicked out King Idris. Uh, we lived right in the area. We, we weren't on the water, but you know, it's like if you walk to the water, it'd be a 10 or 15 minute thing. So it's the Mediterranean, and my brothers were teenagers, and they liked to snorkel. It was great snorkeling, spectacular snorkeling. And so Chris and Paul would go out with nets and go snorkeling out and find, not intact, and certainly nothing like that, but portions of amphora that had been a result of shipwrecks or damage or thrown over over board, and bring those parts home, and they they still have some of those in their possession. So that was like a very casual, accessible thing. And then coincidentally, in our neighborhood, our street was called Bichu Tuit Boulevard, because <laughs> <laughs> it was all Air Force people that had been there. There was an air base. Um, and they were doing excavations, which were like a, essentially the size of a large double bed, but going down. And those workers were hauling out all sorts of uh, tomb artifacts that we were able to see during that time. So I, like, I feel like I was sort of wallowing in all this comprehension of universal art forms and beauty. So I'm, a, I'm prejudiced towards beauty. And there have been times when beauty was not popular in the art world, I would say, just sort of generally. And I haven't been uh, concerned about my interest in that because, again, the Persian miniature painting is, is elegant and very, very beautiful and has served me well. Um, and I will show, I'll show you a few things before I get right into the series. So I'm going to pass these around. Uh, this, they're hard to see unless you look at it really close. These are both brass plates from Iran. I bought this one in 1958 when I was eight years old for 100 rials. And if you look at it closely, you will see the kind of detail that the artisans were producing with their work. And it was obviously something that I was interested in. You know? And so that's, that's an important little, this is a little show and tell for you guys. And then this is also from Iran. My mom must have bought it and she gave it to me. Um, so this is like you know, 70, almost 70 years old, 65 years old. And I'm only showing it to you because Seeing these kind of fundamental shapes that are not precious, not precious at all, but were made pretty quickly and casually, but are beautiful. And, and also have references to the female form. You know, you can see that. Like Chrissy and I were talking about, it's almost like these little handles are arms, and that this is the body of the woman. So, um, I'm not going to pass that one around. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, so we're getting into the current thing, which is in 96 or 97, I was really painting a lot in gouache, and I came up with this idea, especially because a science woman, I'm like, okay, I want to analyze the way I work. I want to analyze it. If I take a simple form like an amphora and just paint those and number them, don't get too hung up on titles, just do them over time, how will they change? How will my work change? And so, Maura Keefe was very kind to loan me this. This is number one. Oh, 
I, that's what it says on the back. Yeah, this is number one. Yeah. She, so so and I and so they it was kind of interesting over time. I worked on the series for at least ten years. I wasn't working on it all the time. I was doing other things as well, but it gave me an opportunity to sort of go. Okay, I start from a kind of bold, quick, fast imagery to getting more and more complicated. And so I'm going to stop with that for now and just say this is number 13. So when I first came up with the series, I just came up with a number. I was like, okay, I'll do 27 of these. Do 27. So by the time you get to 13, I had actually been producing quite a bit. I had showed uh, the work at the Noyce Gallery in Kalispell. That was the first time I showed any of the work um, and, and was kind of enjoying it. So the deal with these is they were never for sale individually. It was definitely that they were a quartet. They had to do with the simplicity of the form and using the form to sort of describe these different elements that Empedocles, who was a Greek philosopher artist who lived in Sicily, uh, or I think or like 430 to 490 BC, a long time ago, he came up with the whole idea of air, earth, fire, and water. And that was very appealing to me. And I think it's partly because I like to go back to simple, the simple, I always make things complicated, but the simplicity of uh, that kind of theory was a appealing to me. And so I took each one of these and kind of worked with a different attribute. So that is water, that's air, this is earth, and then it's fire. Um, and, and the story behind that is I, I had the second show I have of these was at the Brunswick Gallery. And um, which I, my husband and I own the building. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna show a group. I probably showed like 10 of them. And Margaret Mudd, who was a former director of the MMAC, had been following my work, and she liked the art historical context of how I was working. And so she came, and we had been talking about having an exhibit of my work. And I think she probably bought these for the museum with that exhibit in mind. But literally, like within months of that purchase, she disappeared. She, like, <laughs> her husband got hired somewhere else. And she left. And, and so the person that took over after her really didn't connect with visual art in the same way, and certainly not with art history. So I had actually forgotten about the paintings. I had forgotten. And then Raphael called me last spring and said, who, who owns these paintings? <laughs> like, we found these paintings in the storeroom. And we don't know. He thought maybe I had loaned them to the, the museum. And I was like, First, I couldn't remember if she bought it for herself or if she bought them for the MMAC, but I'm almost positive they were for the collection. Um, but he was excited because we were able to, he's able to connect it to what is literally the oldest object in the collection, which is this amphora on the, in the form here. So he was, it was, he was very happy when I did some memory digging and came up with the fact that it was obvious that she had purchased them, and it was in 97 or 98. I could probably figure that out. So. Um, and em Empedocles was a very interesting person if you want to read about him. They actually know a little bit about him. And, um, and then the, the, the big thing that I, I found out was that he is supposedly died by jumping into Mount Etna. Yeah, because he thought, he believed in reincarnation. So I think he thought he would just sort of take another form. It's pretty, pretty dramatic. There's plays about him. But, um, so that's, that's kind of where that is. And then um, after these were exhibited, which brought me into the mid numbers, like the teens, um, the, I was going to exhibit in San Francisco at the Artist Gallery of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art with Christy and Nancy Erickson. And who was, who was the other, that guy? Harold Schlatter, was that? Who was the other? Oh, he wasn't in our group. No. no. There was a fourth artist. Anyway, we, we were showing in 2000, and I, I knew that. And so I got really revved up and worked very hard for that. And I was specifically going to show the 27 Amphora series. And so this painting here is from that period of time. 
And, and what's interesting, the reason I wanted to show you a range of the work is, so this is probably, I don't have the number in front of me because I can't find my black notebook that has all my data. It's in my basement. I know it's somewhere, but it's not, not easily uh, accessible. So as you can see, my work goes from more simple and bold to more complicated. And I don't know that that's always the best thing, but that's obviously, if I'm trying to question how I work, that seems to be the way that I work. So these were shown, this um, there, and it was, it was actually really nice to um, show in San Francisco because there was more people that came to that show that understood the Persian miniature uh, connection. And I had people coming up to me being, oh, you must like Persian miniature painting. And I'm like, <laughs> never heard that in Montana because there was limited, this museum didn't exist. The population was a lot smaller, and my distribution of the images was limited as well. But um, these two are also from, from that era, although Chrissy owns this one. This is probably more like 17 or 18, somewhere in there. So what happened is I got to 27 for that exhibit, and, um, and it felt like a big deal. I mean. Technically, it shouldn't have been a, um, anything particularly important, but I was, by then I was like really fixated on the number. So number 27 <laughs> was really important. So by then, because the paintings were getting more complicated, I was doing smaller studies prior to investing hundreds of hours on the big ones. And so um, I, the big one of this is owned by a collector in Virginia. But this painting, I don't know, I started adding more like a Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden mm -hmm. and looking at kind of origin mm -hmm. things. So the narrative content really increased. And I, I decided to keep this one because it was important. Mm -hmm. So overall, I probably got to number, I don't know, number 40 or 38. I started getting commissions after the show in California with some of the work. Um, and then I would sort of drop it and then pick it up. So I also did some work with monotypes, like prints, one-of-a-kind prints of amphora, because I was really on a roll with the shape. Um, and also uh, a reduction relief prints. But it was started, I, I do work in series, so it was starting to, like, it sort of went up. The show in California was sort of a, like a peak and then sort of went into other areas of interest. So, any questions? Ooh. I'm not really done, but I don't want to take a pause. Well, um, <laughs> yeah. I have, um, I just see, I don't know what happened between number one and number like 13 or whatever it was, but there is a big change in your palette between that one yeah. and that one. And I'm just wondering, did you, um, I know how I describe it. How would you describe that change, or were you just unaware of it? You, you know, I don't think I really thought of it too much, but one of the things that happened is I would never have called myself a landscape painter, never, okay? But I did a series of paintings for a uh, gouache painting series called Peep Shows, Montana Peep Show Stories that traveled around the state, and it was stories about Montana. So I actually went down to Traveler's Rest before Traveler's Rest was made into a... Uh, educational center and I sketched the landscape because I wanted to put Sacagawea and Clark in that landscape and I thought the painting was really successful and I was surprised that it but it sort of made sense because the Persian miniature stuff they have lots of landscape in that work so I think I felt more confident integrating landscapes and I, but the landscape would be not such bright elemental colors it would be more muted by well I think these are even more muted than then, one. yeah, oh, yeah. The, these are, yeah. yeah. Well, so that's it. So yeah, I would say I hadn't identified it, but it's part. I mean, it is kind of interesting. It's like, how does your brain work, and what, <laughs> what is your stimulation, and what? It's all about choices. Like, what are the choices you're making now, as opposed to before, and how you build up on it. So yeah, you're, pro yeah. So I wish I had found my notebook, I mean, because I, I could probably give you a better description, because I would write little things about what stimulated that particular piece. Um, what stimulated number one? <laughs> number one was just sort of feeling a burst of energy. 
like really feeling a burst of energy and sort of excited to, uh, oh, I, you know, the great thing about being an artist is you really, as my husband said, there are no art police. There's no art police. You really, you know, maybe people will or won't like it. That's a whole separate matter. But there is no, you're the, you're, you have total autonomy on doing this. And I know that's probably what led me to leave genetics and biology and botany and move here. Because what I ran into with the scientists is you had to adhere to this, the external reality. That it, there is a science there. You can't add lots of polka dots to the butterfly if they don't exist. Yeah. <laughs> well, the segue off you of can. that, you can. Um, Leslie, uh, can you speak a little bit about what, I, I mean, having finished the That's tour that I did on women artists in Montana, and you were one of them, can you talk about your experiences being a woman coming here in the 1970s and what it was like and how you survived? Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I have to admit, when I left my college, I was irritated with them because I'm, I'm pretty headstrong. And there were things that I felt critical. Looking back, I'm like, are you kidding? It was a spectacular <laughs> place. And I was very fortunate to be at a school that was all women and all very motivated women that were doing interesting things. So I think having that background, which I really, as a 20-year-old, I didn't really get it. But I got it, you know. And their whole thing is they wanted, I mean, the, the school in particular was founded by the Mary Lyon, and her theory was we had to go out into the world and make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so I think that in, sort of would, you know, inform me from behind. And just, I think being in Iran and having, seeing people that would be in what we would call poverty, having pretty good lives and being content with their situation, it sort of changed the attitude about, your status in society and economic things that might have been motivating other other people and those kind of forces. But the the feminist thing is really important. And I again, it was kind of unconscious. I was just here doing what I wanted to do. And I very much consider myself an independent artist when a lot of people my age that had the capacity to were going into graduate school so they could teach and have an income and, and have security that way. And I think I was ready to risk it, for, you know, having the background that I did, which was lucky. But um, yeah, I'd say, I'd say the the women thing is very, very strong. It's very strong. And I'm, as you probably know, I'm in the Patty Canyon Ladies Salon. I wanted to say that was also, I had I started in there in '89. So by the time I started this series, I had been in the group for eight or nine years and was repeatedly drawing the female figure nude twice a month really pretty, with seriously, with other women. And so I can't help but think that amphora shape also resonated with that experience of being in the women's group. And, and I was noticing, a friend of mine was up here the other day and, and took a photo of my work. And then she's like, oh my gosh, the, 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 there's not just the amphora there, but the pregnant woman. We've got a lot of womb-like um, imagery there. So, I don't know what does that does that well, and also how did you how did, were you um, how did you go through that 1970s where it was mostly men teachers men artists and you were doing gouache and everybody else was doing acrylic I I am I'm pretty strong-willed and I and I I think again that kind of I have an independent streak and so I was like yeah, maybe this isn't popular. And I mean, Montana, I think part of it I like is Montana was off the radar screen. So nobody was really paying very much attention to what was going on here. And so it's like, what the hell? I mean, I'm not going to make much money anyway. I'll do exactly, exactly what I want to. And, you know, one of the things I noticed is when I was, um, when I first moved here and I actually thought about uh, trying to go here for graduate school for about 14 seconds. And then I went and talked to Walter Hook and said, this is what I want to do. And he's like, oh, you'll never get it here. You know, you're going to have to move to Arizona. And I'm like, I'm not moving to Arizona. I'm going to stay here. So I, I dropped that. But the other thing is, much of the department was male dominated, very male dominated. So I would have great girlfriends who were artists who were taking classes, and they would complain about the male instructors. I have to be honest, you know, I didn't take notes, but it reiterated my stance that it wasn't worth it, that I had confidence I could teach myself. I didn't, I didn't feel like I needed instruction in how to do art. I did like art history, so every once in a while I would plug into opportunities there. 
Yeah, and, and, and I would say that overall, too, that kind of glass ceiling that I absolutely now, in retrospect, can see existed, I was too, too young and naive to even know that. I was just like, I'm just going to keep going, you know, like, and try and experimenting. You know, and that's a scientist, like, okay, well, we're going to have a show here, and we're going to meet these people up and, like, try it. So I, I was, like, kind of, like, all over the place, but I liked that freedom that, I'm, I'm, and I don't know whether it exists as well here. I mean, everything's gotten a whole lot more professional and sort of uh, like, I don't know. I don't know what it would be like to be a younger artist starting out. I think it would actually probably be kind of hard. Were, were you, um, I could be wrong by that. It was my understanding that gouache was mostly used in the United States uh -huh. for um, graphic art, for um, advertising. And, and that, Which you happen to escape the whole madman era <laughs> by being in Tehran. Yeah. Plus, you were introduced to this material you from know, a different. Wasn't just a, co a commercial art. So this is what's weird. So when I started getting it, see, I couldn't buy gouache in Missoula. You know, there was no gouache in Missoula. I mean, I get it in London. And I didn't go to London to buy gouache, but I, I was there. <laughs> And they have, and again, I just, a side thing is that uh, England has had that long history with India, and I didn't understand until I was in London how much the Indian art and the Persian art intersect. There's a lot, and in fact, the Persian art really influenced the Indian much more so, and they traded artisans and all that stuff. But, um, okay, where, where was I going with that? Well, oh, commercial, oh, yeah. it, commer it was used for commercial art in the United States. So, so I, so I couldn't find it in, in Missoula, and then I'm not going back to London all the time, but I was going back to the New York area because of my family being there, and I would go into New York City, and there was a spectacular art store called New York Central Supply. And Pearl Paint was like the department store of art, and New York Central Supply was like where the really serious artists went, and it was small, and, they, and he had like 10 types of gouache. So I would go in and I would be like wallowing, oh, I'm going to try this one, I'm going to try this, I'll buy this, bring it back, buy brushes, bring it back. Uh, and then eventually they started selling some of the supplies at the university bookstore, which of course now they no longer do. But at that time, people looked down on gouache because the designers were using it. The designers were using, this is pre-internet, pre programs on the internet where you can do all sorts of stuff. They were having to do stuff by hand, and the gouache was good because it dried really quickly. You could cover the colors if you wanted to. It was beautiful. Um, so I'll tell you one really funny story. So in this period of like buying materials elsewhere, I was in Paris on a layover too, and I go to, Sennelier is a very famous paint maker in France, and they have the original Sennelier store in Paris. And I'm like, oh, I'll go get some Sennelier gouache. So I go in, there's this like 80 year old guy behind the counter, totally French. And he's like the grandson of the original owner from like the 70s, 80s. And I'm like, oh, hi, you know, I'm an American artist. I want to buy some of your gouache. And he's like, ah, what are you doing painting in gouache? And, and I was like, well, you know, I, I like, I'm doing, and he's like, oh, that's a trash paint. He said, that is a trash paint. You should be painting in oil. And I, I was like, so he, he wandered away. He wandered away. Some other customer came in, and fortunately, there was somebody else working there. And so I like grabbed what I wanted and went and like snuck out of the store. But that, that, was, that was telling. I was like, OK, this is a guy whose company actually made gouache, but it was like he discounted it. So that was kind of what was going on. And what was really ironic is in these multiple trips to New York, I, so I got to know the owner a little bit. And I came in one time, and there was many fewer brands of gouache. And I'm like, OK, so what's going on? He said, oh, they're going out of business. The companies are going out of business. And I said, why? He said, because the designers are their primary clients, and they're all switching to computers. They're switch and so the, there's not the big demand for that type of paint. And I was like, oh my god, what if they stop making it all together? And he said, no, a few people will. But you don't have that big, broad thing. So what's very interesting is when the designers stop working with gouache, it's, it's gained more prestige. So it's like, it's like weird, like these weird art things. I mean, it, you know, if you're an artist, I mean, we you can talk about this stuff all day long. It's like, okay, is oil more important than water media? Is sculpture more important than two? I mean, it's like, yeah. 
Yeah, so I would say now there's more interest in gouache, more people are using it. It's still, I wouldn't say it's terribly common, but you can find it and, and um, you know, it's, it's, it's recognized as a desirable medium. And luckily, a lot of that has leveled out. It's not that you're considered an important artist if you do oil, but you're not if you use water media. I mean, would you guys agree? The, yeah, the, that I ranking. Mean, and, and there are some major, was it Hilda von Klimt? Yes. She did these giant paintings in gouache. I mean, I don't know. No, I saw it. So, so, so Hilda, Hilda Van Clint is this artist that did all this work like in the 1890s and 1910. She's, she dies, it goes into storage forever, and then they kind of quote unquote rediscovered her because fortunately a family member made sure they were safe. And at first I heard about her and then there's like all these magazine articles talking about her. And I looked at them and I went, those look like gouache and they're big. I mean, there's a whole series that are literally like six feet across and to eight feet tall. So they had a show in New York five or six years ago. Of her, it was like a big deal. I think it was at the Guggenheim. Yeah, it was at the Guggenheim. It was at the Guggenheim, so I, I tried to go to see it. Literally, it's the only time I've tried to go to an art show, and it was like trying to get into a rock concert. I mean, there was like people snaked all around the blocks, and I finally got in, and I go and look, and I was absolutely correct. They are giant gouache paintings. And they're beautiful. So, and that means they've held up, you know, 130 years of, of uh, duration. And re very worthwhile. And it has that nice matte surface that I think is so beautiful, too, if you're familiar with her work. Did that inspire you to go larger? You know, I, I did work large in the 80s for a while. And large, not large. <laughs> um, but not really, no. I mean, I, I have a friend who really wants me to work like that size, and I'm like, ah, oh, it'd take me like all year long, because I, I work so like so detailed. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's never, but it's not, I mean, yeah, it's not a natural thing, because it's a big commitment. Because some of the big paintings I've worked on recently, which again are not very large, but they have like 200 or 250 hours in them, so. Yeah? How do you see the intersection between science woman performance and your art? Oh, you mean like in lecturing or, or normally? When, when you actually do When a performance? Yeah. It's the creative thing. I mean, it's like you can do what you want to. Oh, and I, I tell you what really prompted me to do science woman is it was an opportunity to present myself as a female in authority with confidence and, you know, like women scientists, not, not many people are going to question your credentials. So even though I'm not a real scientist, <laughs> there's, there's, this, there, there's this aspect of giving you credibility. And so I used to do, for about a five-year period, I did um, the, a performance at the art auction, the Missoula Art Museum's auction, about the value of buying art. And they lasted five or 10 minutes, but it was all these kind of crazy theories that if you actually purchased art, not just looked at it, but purchased it and put it in your home, your hair would grow back, <laughs> your, your, your animals would be really smart. You know, so I liked using humor, but, but I also, there was a period um, in the 90s uh, that I, would go, I went into like Sentinel High School and some of the schools and talked to classes of girls and I said, you can do this, you know, you, you can be a scientist, and downplayed the humor part, but just said, you know, I, my college specialized in it, you know. There are a lot of doc female doctors from the 70s from Mel Holyoke. Does that answer? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and just, yeah, like, uh, it's mostly that it, it's a reminder that you really can kind of explore ideas. I, I'm motivated by ideas. Christy, how am I doing? Oh, you're great. I mean, it's you want to know it's 2.50. Oh, that's time. So, oh, okay. No, I'm not the uh, no, no. Here, but I'm letting you know you're okay. right at your mark. Okay. <laughs> good, good, that's good. Well, I'll look and see. So I, I hope I uh, have spoken. I want to give a plug to Tom Benson. It was really helpful because he is doing research. He's going to be doing a talk about Missoula artists that are in the collection that you know that and their work here related to other objects in the collection. Is that right? Yeah, so he called and he's, he did great research on this amphora here. I won't spoil, I'll let you come back for his lecture, but he found out who donated it 
And the, the interesting thing is there's synchronicity between when it was acquired and when my family was in Iran. Yeah, al almost, yeah. And, and uh, that, that part made me kind of happy to think somebody fished it out of the water at the time we were going back and forth. Yeah? Yeah, I don't see, um, maybe this is through choice. Remember you, probably 15 years ago, you had the series of women's friendship, Gertrude Stein? Oh, those were prints, yeah. Prince, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, that's an important point. I work in series. So when I say I started in the, like, 96, 97, and probably worked on these off and on until about 2005 or 2006, it's sort of like you, you kind of ebb and flow. And then I, I, I do. It's like I'm exploring an idea or a concept. So those were prints that I was do doing to empower women and to honor women that I the thought were significant. Series, oh. that you're so great. Yeah, yeah. And so what's ironic, so I started that in the 90s. I started that in the 90s to talk about different attributes that I thought were important to credit women with and individual women, thinking, oh, okay, I did that. And it's like now they're all the more critical because a lot of the things that these people that I identified in the imagery, it's all, it's all coming up again, you know, um, which is kind of sad, but the, the prints are still re relevant, I guess I would say that, yeah. Kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you clarify about prints and postcards? Prints and postcards, like what yeah, the... Well, Prince, yeah. The, so these women, but you also the postcards yeah. are. A so what? Yeah. So I'm very well. politically motivated. I'm very concerned about what's going on. I have I've started marching against nuclear stuff in downtown Missoula in the 80s. So I mean, uh, those things motivate me. So the the prints that Maura is referring to were relief prints in smaller editions that cost you know they cost a couple hundred dollars to buy unframed to have in your home. But I became really invested in making sure that those sentiments in the imagery could be available for 75 cents. <laughs> you know, so I, I had, and Kathy was really helpful in helping me. I did this 20 years ago. Those were all gone. And then more recently with all the kind of crazy political stuff, it motivated me to do a reprint of the postcards that could be sent out to motivate people to vote or to um, honor women in education or, you know, there's just a whole bunch of sentiments. But I, I am, a, and some of my artist friends don't like the idea of postcards or commercializing their work. Um, and I, again, I'm like, okay, it's not, it doesn't take anything away from the bigger pieces because they're on beautiful paper and they're hand printed. But I, I think it's really important that artists, I, I came up with a title like, Artist in Action. I feel like artists need to step forward because I'm convinced that if you did, this is one of my big theories, if you did an analysis of the general art population, and by that I mean creative people, whether you're a baker or a painter or a writer or what, I bet the murder rates are much lower than the general population. And the quality of life is up. And the emphasis on making lots and lots of money is down. Because the vast majority of artists are not in it for the money. They're really happy if they make money. But they're motivated by their interest in the art and their inner dialogue. So I'm going, hey, guys, we need to step forward if we're going to see the ship turn around right now. I mean, that's my little political speech. Is there a way to see more of your work? Oh, thank you. That's very sweet of you. I have a, a very poorly maintained website. <laughs> I, did, I do it when I have to, and I shouldn't be like that. But also, yeah, I mean, you, if, you, if you know me, let me know. I'd be happy to show it. And then I show at the Brunswick in the gallery. We're going to have a show of the Patty Canyon Women's Group again in May. We just made a decision about that. So you can look forward to that. I'll have some new work in that that I'm planning to do. Um, I but, used to see a little of your stuff at Bathing Beauties. Yeah, I no, I know, and Bathing Beauties is gone, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are your postcards available now? If you talk to me, they okay. are, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> please okay. let me know. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i kind of my own worst enemy about marketing, but I'm happy to, but it, yeah. But, so I have this compulsion that I, I think is kind of common to look for autobiographical signs in people's work. And so I'm looking at number one. Yeah. And, and then those, and then, then this one and this one. And, and what I'm seeing, this is totally me making this up, <laughs> is your trajectory from Iran to the Jaco. 
Oh, and in, yeah. You know, in particular, this, you know, putting the, the, the landscape. Yeah. The la I don't know when you started putting landscapes in, but I was sort of curious about it, if it was concurrent with your effort to build your house there. Oh, actually, it was... It was, yeah, because we, we uh, you, some friends have heard about this ad nauseum, but we started a process of trying to build a house in the late 90s. It didn't work out. Then we worked on plans that came to fruition in 2005, and it took almost four years to build it. It was like torture. But during that time, yeah, so the, 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 that's right, yeah. And I was going out to Arlie a lot, to We love the Jocko Canyon and going out there and really identifying with the, the land. And that's gotten stronger and stronger as I've lived here longer and I'm older. Yeah. And so the last thing I would say, being 73 years old and looking back over well over 50 years of making art, that it's really different. You know, it's different because you can put things in context. And I really appreciate that the MMAC asked me to give this talk because I mean, all the stuff's in my head, but I don't think I would have formulated it and, and felt happy with people that were interested to learn about it, to actually do that kind of analysis, like what's, well, how, do, how did we, I get to this and what's in the future? Yeah. Well, as a docent, I can now talk about these four pieces with so much love. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs>